Hello, and welcome to Rock Your Block and today's segment of Ernestine J. Wilson Real Estate. I am your host, Ernestine Wilson, managing broker of Ernestine J. Wilson Real Estate. We have a very special guest for you today. He is a mortgage loan professional with over seven years experience helping investors and homeowners finance and refinance real estate loans. He leads an awesome team at Watermark Capital Inc. And they are dedicated to keeping contract timelines and they do it with a smile. Please welcome to the set, Louis Berman. Hi, Louis. Hi, Ernestine, thanks for having me here. Oh, I'm so glad to finally meet you face to face. I know, we've been pen pals and, and phone call buddies for a few years now. So. I know, <laughs> done settlements, yep. talked, laughed a lot. Yep. Remember when your second child was born? Yes, I remember that very, very well. Yeah, because yeah. you were out of pocket for just a day or so. Yeah, just, just a day or so. Which... So, welcome again. <laughs> oh, thanks Ernestine, thanks for having me. So, I'm gonna start by asking you, how did you get started in the mortgage loan business? It's a, it's a really funny story. So in college, I played football and I graduated uh, right after the housing crisis. So the job market wasn't awesome. So I got a job in Eastern Europe coaching uh, partner stunning or co-ed cheerleading where I would throw people over my head. <laughs> and I did that for three or four months, came back to the States. And then uh, I got a job in DC uh, working in the kind of a, the, the legal realm. Um, I didn't really like that because I liked being athletic. I liked helping people. I thought that was more fun. So I coached cheerleading for four more years until my back got so bad uh, that I couldn't throw people over my head for a job anymore. And that about that time, I reached out to one of my old college football teammates who seemed to be doing really well. And I asked him what he was doing. He was like, Lewis, I'm in mortgages. And I was like, wow, that's awesome. So I went to go work with him at a call center for about six months and then after that, I wasn't sure if that was the, the right field for me. I got a uh, call from one of my old cheerleading coaches, and he said, Lewis, one of my friends is looking for an assistant. Um, so I got into the retail mortgage world uh, through sports, ironically enough. But uh, that was the phone call where I started doing real loan origination, helping local people purchase, finance their, their goals, because that, that meant a lot more to me than sitting behind a desk at a, at a phone all day. Okay. Yeah. So were you, I know that you went to Maryland, you mm -hmm. played football at Maryland. Yeah. Are you from the Metro DC area? So it's funny, I grew up, I was born in Johnson City, Tennessee. I grew up in Tucson, Arizona. And then when, my, when I was <laughs> 16, uh, my father got a job uh, in Maryland contracting for the FBI. He's a forensic accountant. And, um, and I came with, and then I've been in the area ever since. So I, I absolutely love it up here. Good, good. Yeah. So tell us about your clients. Who are your typical clients that you work with? Yeah, uh, and there's a wide range of them, right? From real estate investors uh, to just you know residential people looking to purchase their first home and everywhere and anybody in between. Um, we do, the majority of our clients are people uh, in the DMV region that want to purchase a, you know, a, a primary residence. I'd say that's probably about 80% of our clients. Um, and then we do service people that want to renovate homes. We do we service people uh, that want to buy investment properties. And, and that's, that's what we're really passionate about. And those are typically the people that we, that we help. Well, speaking of clients, mm -hmm. every time the Federal Reserve meets, yep. my clients call me because they call me about yep. just about everything. Mm -hmm. And they wanna know how the Fed's rate, either being higher or lower, mm -hmm. is going to affect them. Yes. So can you please tell us about the correlation between the two? Absolutely, and that, Ernestine, that's a call that I get all the time too. And I think the simplest way to put it is that the Fed funds rate, the rate that they raise or lower, it only impacts short-term money. Those things are, uh, credit card loans, auto loans, interest rates on your HELOC if you have one. Um, Long-term money like mortgage bonds, those are impacted by the how the bond coupons are trading on Wall Street. And sometimes, like the period we're in right now where the Fed's trying to combat record high inflation, 
um, the Fed controls a lot, of, a lot of money, right? So when they raise those interest rates, it doesn't always have an impact on mortgage bonds. What has an impact on mortgage bonds is who's purchasing the mortgage bonds and what rate they're purchasing in that. And right now we're in a period where every type of interest rate is just higher because the Fed's trying to combat inflation. So I hope that answered the question. I know it's a little, it's a little complicated, but basically the takeaway is that rate does not always have a uh, correspondence with mortgage rates. And that's the point that I wanted you to get to. Yep. And a lot of people just don't get that. Oh yeah, I understand. I had a client that called me and said the, the Fed fund rates at zero, why isn't my mortgage rate zero percent? And they are just two completely separate items. Um, the, the low interest rates, when the, when the Fed raises or lowers interest rates, your HELOC payment's gonna be more expensive, your credit card payment's gonna be more expensive. Um, your mortgage payment, right, in the middle of your, most people get fixed rate mortgages, right? So that's not gonna be touched. People obtaining a new mortgage, they get current market interest rates based on how the bond coupons are trading on Wall Street. Okay, thank you for that. Yeah, no problem. I, I get those questions all the time too. <laughs> Well, speaking of rates, mm -hmm. that's another burning question for yeah. most people. And it is, especially the ones who are in the process yep. of buying or refinancing. Mm -hmm. And they wanna know, am I getting the best rate? Mm -hmm. uh, what's gonna happen in the future? Yeah. So I have a very serious question to ask you. Do you have a crystal ball? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I did. <laughs> what I do know and what I've seen throughout the course of history is that interest rates are very cyclical in nature. Rates are sometimes higher and rates are sometimes lower. They don't stay the same forever, right? And I think that's really important for buyers to know in this market because one of my favorite stories is, is people in October. I remember October like 2019, rates were almost 5% and then they had been around 3.5%. Um, I had clients that purchased then, then refinanced uh, a few years later, and their rates in the twos, right? And that's the biggest piece that, that I think anybody should take away that's buying a home right now. Your interest rate that you close on is not your interest rate forever. When interest rates get better, you have the opportunity to refinance. Only along that time versus the people that waited, you're building equity right? You're getting mortgage interest deductions. There's lots of benefits to home ownership. So as long as you're sticking to an affordable payment, I think you're going to be okay and you're not going to look back on your decision to buy as something that you wish you would have done differently. Well, my clients always ask me, is now a good time to buy? Mm -hmm. So I say to you, when is the best time to buy? So I'm also a real estate investor. So we have 16 properties. And the best time to buy from my experience and just looking at my clients and their success stories over the years, it was probably yesterday. Um, and in this market yesterday, right? We're in a very unique market in this DMV region where there's a lot of um, employees in this economy is basically built on government wages. I don't see them uh, decreasing taxes anytime soon. Um, so we're in a really well insulated market. DC at the height of the housing crisis that was built upon you know predatory lending practices and a lot of um, really tough things in our industry, housing was stagnant in DC. And although surrounding areas have gotten hit a little bit, as long as you're sticking to an affordable payment uh, or you have an exit strategy for the property, I don't think you can go wrong with buying in any market as long as the numbers make sense for you and as long as you are guided by somebody like you to make sure that you're making a, a decision to live in an area or buy in an area that's going to make you happy long term. Okay, I get that. And without being redundant, mm -hmm. when is the best time to refinance? Refinance. Refinance. That's a great question. I don't recommend every single refinance to my clients. I only recommend it when it makes sense. And the way to gauge that is there's always a cost for refinancing and then there's the benefit, right? And basically, you know, from a high level perspective, right? If the refinance costs $5,000 and you save $500 a month, right? You recoup that period in 10 months. That's a good situation. Um, if the refinance costs are $50 or the, the costs are $5,000 and you only save $50 a month, 
that's a much longer recoup time, right? So usually it's best when you can recoup that period within two or three years. I like to recommend on my team, no, no cost refinances, where we basically, um, let's say the best rates, uh, 4%, right? But at 4.125%, we can pay the one-time closing costs with a lender credit. Um, then you have immediate savings, right? There's no recoup time. So I think the best way to put that is you refinance when you can recoup the costs in two to three years, right? Or you do a no cost refinance and whenever those make sense. And when we know those make sense is when the market allows for it, when mortgage bonds are trading well, when interest rates are in a good position and it meets the person's goals, right? Are they saving enough monthly, right? Sometimes people do cash out refinances to be able to fund um, different, different aspects of their lives. There's lots of types of refinances, but as long as it's meeting your goals and the costs and charges are made up in a reasonable amount of time, I think that's a good time to refinance. Okay. That's a, a lot of uh, <laughs> yeah, a lot of information <laughs> and Absolutely. a lot of things happening, but uh, yeah. you explained it very well, so thank you. Oh, thanks, Ernestine. So now people are, I'm told, mm -hmm. using credit cards yeah. and borrowing money mm -hmm. to take care of their everyday expenses yeah. because of inflation. Yeah. Do you have advice for these people who will be coming to you and? A little while to say yeah. either they want to buy a house or they want to refinance. Yeah, yeah and, that, and that's a really um, tough situation for a lot of people, right? We Right now things are more expensive. People are putting more and more um, credit card debt. They're utilizing more of their credit card debt. I see it a lot in mortgages. And one of the biggest things that uh, a credit score is calculated off of is utilization, right? Try to keep your utilization on each card below 20 or 30 percent. That usually yields a good score. Um, the other piece of it too is like a lot of people have credit cards with no interest for, or they have a promotional period of time where there's no interest on those things. One of the cool things that we offer is rescores, right? So when we pull a credit report, we can run a simulator, which is pretty accurate and we can tell somebody what balance to pay their card down to. So while I don't recommend everybody running up their debt as high as possible, um, what I think that we can do to be able to help people is take that snapshot, right? Make sure if you're not paying the balance on your card every single month, um, you're doing so on a credit card with very low interest or no interest, right? And then um, if you are going to be purchasing a home, make sure you keep those balances low. That's probably my best recommendation. Um, you know, there's ways to restructure debt through for current homeowners that using equity lines, those are typically lower than credit card interest rates, um, you know, which are which are very high. So if anybody has questions about that or, or needs help or needs needs a resource, you know, we're always happy to help analyze the entire situation. Um, because it is, it is tricky because sometimes people do have a lot of debt. Sometimes there's ways to be able to fix that and get the optimal credit score. Uh, we can always rescore credit as well. Okay, and do you use that simulator that you mentioned to take care of that also to uh, rescore? Yeah. Is that part of it? Yeah, so, so what, what a lot of people don't um, know is that the credit, the credit report that we pull, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have to be the one that you use at the time of your, your mortgage. We can rescore credit. Um, so if somebody needs to pay down a balance or somebody needs to wait a few months, right? Those are all things that we can help strategize for. Um, some people will want to rescore to get a better interest rate because rates in most loan programs do have credit score adjustments. Um, some people would need to increase their score to be able to just qualify for a loan, right? And we can assist with both of those, those avenues. Okay. Well, what if a person has challenging credit? Yeah, that's a really, that's a really good question. So kind of our workflow as a team, right? We, we get an application, we pull credit, credit's rough, right? We need to be able to be at, you know, X score to be able to get a loan. What we can do is we run the simulator, right? Sometimes the simulator, uh, there's so much, derog there's a lot of derogatory things on their credit report. It gets really tough to be able to discern what we can do. In that case, um, I have an old teammate of mine, Laquan, who helps with credit repair, and we also refer out a couple other people, but basically they can enroll in one of those programs, and what they can do is they can work towards helping get maybe some inaccurate information removed or work towards um, helping that person repair their credit because there's only so much 
um, you know, paying down balances can do. Sometimes the biggest help is time or entering into a credit repair program uh, to be able to get credit in, to a reasonable place. So you do advise people to get credit repair or to get into a credit repair program? With people that we've worked th for in the past that have had success with it, there are a lot of but you know companies out there that you know sometimes it's it sounds like it's a little bit of a scam and sometimes those those programs haven't worked out well for people um, we do like recommending people where we've had success before um, and we've had a lot of clients that couldn't qualify for a loan and then they've get into one of these these programs 6 12 18 months later they're in a position to buy um, that process is very intricate on the back end um, where, you know, there's lots of, uh, you know, the, the way that works is a, is a little bit confusing, but they give steps to be able to help remove the derogatory items. When I run a simulator, all I can do is see, show what paying the balances does to a credit report. Um, or if there is a, an, uh, an incorrect collection, um, what paying that off or getting that removed can look like. Recently, I uh, experienced a client having a challenge mm -hmm. on her credit report yeah and the mortgage lender that she was working with did not want to see that challenge wanted it removed yeah is that the way your company uh, looks at those two because that's what most credit repair people do that I've yep. experienced yeah yeah they'll work on removing the line item right which okay. is very difficult because there's a litigious process they have to go through to be able to get something removed. Either it has to be, they, and a lot of times this is what happens, right? Um, even with, with some of the super high net worth clients, you move, they send a bill to the old address, then that they never had your correct address, and then a credit account gets placed on collection, crushes your score, right? So what those credit repair agencies will do a lot of times is make sure that they had the accurate information to give people proper notice, right? They can prove that doesn't happen, right? They can dispute that enough times. That's how things get removed. And we do, we do um, like to, you know, that's usually the easiest score, right? If somebody has a collection, right? Perfect payment history, good balance utilization, and then they do have a collection, right? And then they're like, I don't know what this is from, or this doesn't sound correct. Removing that is sometimes a really easy way to be able to get that higher score because paying a collection typically um, shows as a, as a paid collection. It doesn't really impact your score positively, even though it should make sense to do that. It just doesn't. So, um, and credit's super complex. So every situation is a little bit different. Uh, you know, I, I, I think that, um, you know, if you're in a position to be able to get, get those things removed and that helps more than anything, um, then that program's right for that person. Okay. One other question about mm -hmm. credit yeah. that just popped into my head. It's fascinating, isn't it? It's, oh. just this, it's, this, it's this algorithm it's that crazy. dictates the way everybody can interact with the world around them when, in the financial sense. Yeah. It is, yeah. and it seems to change all the time. Oh, yeah. So tell me this. If I have two high, high uh, credit uh, cards, mm -hmm. like, 50,000, 20,000, mm -hmm. and I pay them off. Mm -hmm. Is that bad? Does, does, that, does my credit score take a hit when I'm down to a zero balance? I'm told that I should leave some balance yep. to carry through, yep. like for the next statement. Mm -hmm. That's true? So it's different in every single person's uh, world, right? So having a little bit of a balance. So what, what the creditors score you on is your responsible use of credit, right? Or at least that's what they say. So basically having zero balance on your, your credit card for years and never using it, that doesn't really help your credit. Um, I ran the simulator be sometimes before and it says pay this down to a $17 balance, right? Mm -hmm. And it's just a completely random number. It's a very um, heartless algorithm. Uh, that just spits these things out and calculates things. But yes, in, in most cases, um, it is pay this down to X balance, not pay it down to zero. In some cases, it is pay it down to zero. So it's different for every single person because credit's incredibly complex. Okay. Yeah. No. <laughs> I wish there was an easier answer where it's just like, I have everything in a $10 balance, you'll be fine forever. Um, but the, the high level rules keep your utilization, you know, under. 30, 20%, right? The lower, the better. Um, make sure you use your credit 
because not using your credit can actually impact you. They, there's a thing called active accounts, right? They want to see that mm -hmm. you're actively, um, you know, using your credit card and then paying it, paying it down or paying it off every month. So it is, uh, it is very complicated. I'm always happy to jump on a phone and talk to somebody or look at a report and kind of go over it with them. But yeah, it's, it's super complex. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Now let's talk about down payments because yep. that's probably the third most frequent question yeah. that I get. Mm -hmm. Do I have to make a 20% down yeah. payment to buy a house? Yeah. So the answer is um, it depends, right? <laughs> so the majority of people um, don't have to, right? So there are lots of DC, Maryland, Virginia all have down payment assistance programs that we utilize. Um, if you're not utilizing one of those programs, usually putting down three to 5% for a conventional loan, three and a half percent down for an FHA loan. Those are all uh, very popular ways. Now, if you're buying an investment property, right, you can put down 15 or 20% depending on what your loan profile looks like, right? So different types of loans have different types of required down payments. So, um, you know, my real estate journey, um, I, util I utilized low down payments pretty much throughout my entire um, my entire journey because I wanted to be in a situation where I had more capital for the next deal. So the answer is you not majority of people do not need 20 percent. Okay. Um, and then the other piece is if you do need 20 percent, it's probably because you're established in your real estate journey. You need to be able to put down some a little bit more for your investor type loan. Okay. Yep. Now will you give us just a general overview of a couple of those down payment programs in the yeah. metro DC area. Yeah, absolutely. So DC has um, the Home Purchase Assistance Program. Uh, they have to go through a, uh, a pretty extensive program um, and they just increased the income table this year so you can get a pretty substantial uh, down payment assistance based on you know how much you're making. It goes off household size. Um, and it's, it's incredible. They also, also DC open doors that'll assist with the minimum required down payment, whether that's three or three and a half percent. Uh, Maryland mortgage program has, um, down payment assistance and grant programs, uh, you know, ranging all the way up to, you know, four or 5%, which is really cool. And then VHDA helps, uh, people in Virginia purchase and make up their minimum required, uh, amount for a down payment. Those typically come in the form of second mortgages that are either, uh, for, for given uh, over a certain period of time. Every program does have nuances, so reach out if you want more information about them. I get it. Yeah. And there's so many of them, and they have so many rules and regulations that, yeah, you'd be the first person I'd call. Yeah, yeah, there's always a little bit of nuance for each one of those. Yeah. How has the home buying process changed from the mortgage in? since you've been in the business or has it remained the same? So I think one of the biggest things that I have seen are loan limit increases, right? So when I first got in the business, the conventional loan limit was 424, 100, I think. Um, and then, you know, this, this year they're projecting it to be over seven, $700,000, right? Um, so sale prices have increased, real estate values have increased since I've got into it. Um, I've seen a wide variety of interest rates um, but for the most part, the thing that's pretty much stayed the same is that people that purchase and hold onto their home, um, they're, they're generally pretty happy in this market. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So can you briefly tell us the difference between a conventional loan mm -hmm. and this is another one of the questions that I get yeah. a lot. Uh, the difference between a conventional loan and FHA and VA loan. Yeah, absolutely. So a conventional loan, is the Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac loans of the world, right? Um, they're depending on if you're you're a first-time home buyer or not, or meet a certain income limit. Um, there's a lot of credit score adjustments. Um, there's PMI that's removable. FHA is the government loan. It's kind of the every person loan. Um, those credit scores can go down to a 580. Um, FHA technically doesn't have a minimum uh, credit score requirement. Um, um, you know, as long as you're above 500 but there's certain overlays that come into play at that point. But FHA is a little bit more expensive because it has required PMI um, and then upfront mortgage insurance as well. And then probably the best loan program that exists period is for our veterans. The VA loan is this loan program where there are no loan limits if you don't have your entitlement tied up. It's a really great way to purchase a home um, and then there's no monthly PMI on those. 
well, I'm not a veteran, mm -hmm. but I want to purchase a home. Yeah. So what would be my best option for a really good home loan? Yep, and it, it's not a simple answer, but it all depends, <laughs> right? Um, so your loan profile, depending on the amount that you have to put down, um, what credit looks like, what income looks like, there's different buckets, but typically the most popular loans are conventional and FHA loans. Um, if you're purchasing a home out in the country, a USDA loan's a good option too. But yeah, there's, there's minimum down payment requirements for uh, conventional loans, which is 3% in most cases, FHA is 3.5%. Um, so it all depends on the person, but those are typically the most popular loans. Okay. Well, we have what we believe is an international audience. Mm -hmm. So we cover the country, of course, because of the places that our shows are shown. Mm -hmm. Where are you licensed? Yeah, so um, Watermark is licensed, I think, in about 49 states. Mm -hmm. um, my team is licensed in DC, Maryland, Virginia, Pennsylvania, Delaware, West Virginia, and Florida at the moment. So anybody seeking a loan in those places, uh, we can definitely help out with. And then I have, um, you know, uh, colleagues across the uh, across the world. If anybody needs an out of uh, out of country or out of state, uh, not referral. Tennessee, not Tennessee. Oh, <laughs> yeah. okay. <laughs> well, Lewis, our time is up. Oh, thanks for having me, Ernestine. I had a great time. Thank you so much for being here. We've had a great time. I, I appreciate you taking the time to have a conversation with me about mortgage financing. So if you have any questions about how to contact our guest, please see the information scrolling below. Thank you for watching Rock Your Block and today's segment of Ernestine J. Wilson Real Estate. We'll see you next time.